welcome to the interaction with the filmmakers as part of the nila international folklore film festival second edition and today we are going to discuss the film backstage by lipika singh darai and first of all let me heartily congratulate her because this film has been included in the indian panorama section of the international um, film festival of india to be held in goa heartily congrats uh, lipika you are really proud of you, Thank you. <laughs> and uh, about lipika she is a graduate of gpti ti and she had the uh, good fortune of uh, um, being working under the uh, maestro mani call and she has uh, probably made a film garuda which is uh, which itself won an award and made an um, attempt to itself fetch an award besides her um, other movies and uh, documentaries uh, like um, some stories around which is and in the shadow of time so um, for her it has been a sort of homecoming after her initial studies and she returned back to her roots and um, in, um, the movies uh, documentaries including um, backstage and others were uh, rooted uh, in the soil of uh, uh, odisha uh, so hurry welcome to you lipika thank you so much sir uh, yeah and um, we have another uh, important um, personality to come to moderate the discussion today and she is ms niharika gupta uh, she is a consultant at uh, international research division of india international center delhi which is an intellectuals hub <laughs> so to say and uh, so uh, she was also a consultant at the end uh, i mean director of uh, content and research at uh, sahapedia which has uh, done tremendous uh, work and which has been doing tremendous work in preserving so many valuable um, our be it in the music and other uh, all uh, related uh, culture and other streams and she had worked on samwad that, that documented uh, the wonderful tradition of uh, bhakti and the sufi uh, music uh, traditions so welcome niharika to nifi is a show yes and in addition we have got um, uh, mohammad rayan who is an uh, designer and animator and he's also a photographer and he's uh, doing the film and the animation from idc at iit bombay so welcome rayan thank you thank you yeah so without um, and um, so without wasting much uh, time let's uh, get on to the talk so um, uh, niharika please uh, carry on thank you so much sir thank you very much and it's really a privilege to be here at nifi and to be interacting with lipika who's it's an incredible film um i'll just start by saying it's unusual to have a film that is simultaneously extremely moving an extraordinary experience and at the same time you're conscious of its exquisite construction and you're also provoked to think and how this kind of whole process of you know thinking and questioning and not coming with some simple answers i mean i find it extraordinary how you've achieved that and the title of the film is backstage and that is a sort of theme that we used to come up with when we used to do visual treatments of the performing arts in sahapedia through the frame series look at the backstage look at the underlying and i was just thinking about it just to get my thoughts together through the film i was thinking of um, okay backstage you see the first the play of the harmonium you see the working of the woodwork and then i was thinking of those shadows the shadow puppetry scene and how they quick thrust quickly flying arrows at each other and then you come to the glove puppetry and there it's not backstage you're in front and you're seeing these people who are not expressive and all the movement is in their hands and the shivering of the gopis and so on and as going on thinking of the play so um maybe would you like to just talk briefly just so that we get the conversation going you've spoken about it earlier about this journey we started in 2012 uh, and your sort of yeah. extraordinary encounter with uh, maguni kumar you have referred to this earlier and how the movement between the sort of wonder and the magic of the performance and the equally sort of interesting and moving encounters behind and how if there's any kind of stages and phases in how this came because 
towards the end of the film, you talk about how you thought of closing it. We'll come to that later, perhaps, and why it did not seem we, adequate. We, maybe we can come to that at a let, later point, but maybe you can just take us through some of the phases of the immersion of the last, the, the journey, the years that you took to make the film, the kind of stages you went through. You can start with that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So thank you so much for having me and thank you for showing this film. Uh, initially, I thought when I finished the film, I thought that it took a long period of time actually for me to finish it. Um, as we all know that every film has its own journey. We don't know how the film is going to you know, be completed and how the funds will be, how the audience will take, you know, see and absorb the film and how as a maker and also at some point the audience, uh, you're going to watch your own film. So, you know, the journey starts from, you know, finding the um, desire to make of audiovisual some kind of a, you know, uh, create a material around audiovisual thing. And then uh, to even, you know, getting uh, the sensor done, getting the approval of the films and then uh, sending into festival. And so the journey is just a, a very long journey for a film like this. Um, as I, as you know, that in 2012, we just, uh, the cinematographer of the film got a, a research grant from National Folklore Support Center, Chennai, and uh, he did a, a, a one and a half year long research on all the forms of puppetry in Orissa um, under the supervision of uh, MD Muthu Kumar Swami. So uh, that was a big, big, big uh, learning experience for the cinematographer and also me because I uh, assisted him as an interpreter because he was a Bengali and he got the project. He was staying in, uh, we both were staying in Odisha. We started our uh, work journey from Odisha around 2012. During that time, uh, as I uh, narrated in the film that, uh, you know, we suddenly got to know about uh, a very magnificent uh, puppeteer who has 300 uh, puppets, wooden puppets. And, um, and we also discussed uh, with the senior journalist that, you know, no one is making films, no one is documenting, no one is uh, also, um, uh, no one understand how to, you know, approach any, the subject, you know, okay, things are, the puppetry forms are dying, uh, we are not getting to see uh, them often. And uh, with that, so many other forms are dying also. Uh, so they are losing their relevance. But if you are a documentator or a filmmaker or a writer or a poet or whoever you are, how to look at it, what do you want to do? That's a big, big, big uh, starting point maybe. And during the conversation with the uh, journalist, we realized that we didn't have to stop there. We need to take one further step and we need to find out that reason and how to look at it, what we want to do. We need to figure out that first. Then that's why we went ahead and uh, met the puppeteer that was just you know, out of our interest. We were not funded, nothing. We just went there and um, uh, that was a very interesting story even like uh, we didn't get his number or phone number. We just knew that he lived in Keunchha district. So we took a train and went to Keunchha station and uh, we asked around and the second auto driver told me, oh, achha, you're looking for that puppet, you're Nundu bhai. Okay, let me, you know, take you there. That's how we meet him. And he greeted us and he was so warm and uh, I just, uh, and he was not also bothered about uh, why we were there. We were there for research or we were there to make films or take photographs or, you know, interview him, nothing, nothing. He just welcomed us like uh, some two curious people have come to just meet me. And that was so, so very, you know, that was overwhelming for him. So he, without asking anything, we just said, uh, he just said, are you here to, uh, you know, see, have you seen my performance? I said, no, no, we have just heard a few and we have just come to see how someone lives with so many puppets. That was like quite interesting to him. It was quite magical to us. Where are your puppets and where do you keep them? Show us, oh, they are inside the boxes. They will come out and 
uh, you want to see a performance i said uh, how many people do you need do you have to call many people and musician and everything he said you don't worry tell me you want to see the performance a little bit i said of course then in the evening he just uh, put up the stage and it takes a lot of time though putting up the stage calling people everything and he did it and we saw it and while seeing we thought that why not record it you know because we are from that filmmaking background and we didn't have camera then at that point we didn't have our own camera so we also not good phones in 2012 so we just uh, got a camera uh, from a journalist a very very simple pd some camera and we just shot it just as it is randomly and uh, in the evening he started to and we saw it for the first time i was uh, watching the performance though i lived in orissa for quite a few years but i hadn't seen uh, puppetry performances i had just seen glimpses of it you know not a performance performance with a puppeteer just next to you so that was very important for me you know having the puppeteer next to me and having that contact and also watching that performance so at that point i felt that no it's not an individual art practice it's like you know you need that connection to have it as as a whole so that evening i just had an idea uh, immediately that you know it's not like individual artist practicing puppetry or something there are few people involved and the audience also uh, have to be involved and somewhere connected and having and looking at uh, the puppeteer in front of me of course you can't see him when he performs he is behind the uh, you know curtain only you can see the puppetry puppets but his presence is so strong because he is giving lives to those uh, you know suddenly the those wooden dead puppets were alive and that was magical for me though i didn't connect to ramayana though i didn't come to come connect to mahabharata much but that connection and that uh, you know that's the magic of bringing life to some uh, dead wooden structures and the capability to do that really really i mean uh, i was so so overwhelmed and then after that um, in the afternoon we were just having tea we became so comfortable with each other so we having tea and i recorded his first interview uh, though it wasn't meant for like we didn't want to me uh, interview him but he was speaking so i thought okay set the frame like this it is so beautiful it's evening it's beautiful light and there is grains and everything i was like cinematically also very beautiful just and the camera could not capture it that was not a very high end camera uh, and we just set the frame and i still remember the conversation between me and an artist so it was also privilege for me to you know have a conversation with with a such an experienced person and that that conversation moved me a lot and that was the beginning of our you know journey to even discover all other forms of puppetry but that conversation moved me and he said that mm, whenever i talked to him there was a suddenly a very loving bond you know just uh, uh, happened between us and uh, i just asked several question and and i asked him that you know in in this so many years you have so many forms you have so many shapes you have so many puppets you have so many stories and you have been to so many places you have so many reaction responses you know this is the wealth of an artist and you know so how did you come across these characters or how did you think that this tune will be like this this that he said that uh, and now at this age how do you think how do you you know create it so he thought that mm, you know it's just the practice and uh, it's in you it's in it's, at some point everything uh, it uh, it uh, comes within you and you just think of it and it happens in front of you it appears and he also makes this huge uh, kali statue for kali puja and durga puja huge uh, mandaps and everything and you know as a as an audience if we look at these artists we just look at them from a distance and see that 
okay it's just a, a big big uh, idol and it, they make it they make it every year and we just look at them but you know it needs a lot of energy to build a, a form from scratch a lot of energy so from where the energy is coming i asked him he said it's just you just get it over the time you get it and you look into the space and everything appears i am at that stage and uh, that remained with me that filmmaking can be any any art form or any practice can uh, you can reach at that point where you can uh, be a magician and you know make things appear <laughs> in front of you make yeah a musician and artist and everyone are kind of magician they make things appear and they there is nothing and then all of a sudden there is a tune there is nothing there is a wooden log all of a sudden there is a form there is nothing but all of a sudden there is a film which is called backstage or whatever like that so i that that motive moved me a lot and i thought i saw a connection where i thought that you know this will be so enriching for me in my journey that which i am going to also start you know so i need to be with this person <laughs> and know what is happening so then that small footage we pitched and we got the uh, fund and that's how the research journey started he became the main collaborator and he helped us uh, to meet other people and other puppeteers then we met gorang charan das who is a scholar and phd uh, holder and he is also a shadow puppeteer contemporary shadow puppeteer so we met him and uh, we also got a very different perspective from uh, him about how he did the research and everything so there are so many phases of our experience and that's how the actually the thing started and when i uh, after 2 years i thought that there is so much of experience i am like uh, where to put it how to put it what to do and uh, film 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 this like <laughs> it needs to be done and then the film idea came in uh, i started pitching uh, to a, like fund funding organization and everything but it was a little difficult because uh, not many people want to you know invest so much of money on a subject like this so there is a lot of you know to convince those funders or whatever <laughs> a lot 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 why you want to make this film why on dying art form what is dying artist is dying or art is dying so many questions that you need to answer so whatever that stage uh, happened and in 2016 i got the fund from films division after three pitching sessions and the film was also on hold for many months uh, and on third pitching session i got the film finally and i was told that the film was uh, you make a well researched documentary which will be having a narrative you know it's a, it should be simple narrative it should not be an abstract film so everyone should understand it and you know it should reach to mass and you should make a simple narr narrative film uh, should not just uh, make an abstract film though i needed a little bit of cinematic uh, freedom which i think i didn't go towards that much because there was so much information that i needed to put in place and also to store for future to archive for future that i chose to you know uh, make this form this simple narrative and a bit of me in the film if i you know may say so mm. uh, yeah in fact and if he is really grateful to film division for uh, uh, sparing the movie and uh, allowing to um, screen it include it in this uh, festival yeah please <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah and since you a, mentioned that very... uh, if if i can uh, add so in certain scenes your presence is there in the frames Uh, was it uh, i mean what prompted you uh, normally uh, all film makers prefer to be behind the camera but in at least two three scenes you are seen in the frames yeah i i'm i'm very conscious of camera very much but uh, uh, that's not uh, the matter at all when i am in the film um the thing is i as a filmmaker and an artist i feel that i handle audio visual material and if i am creating that material i am also part of the entire thing so even if i am so i would love to have my presence if it is needed if i feel that you know uh, my physical presence is also adding to the film or um 
uh, you know, because uh, the artist presence really, really uh, moved me. I, as I said, you know, presence of Maguni Charan Kaur in front of me performing. So a filmmaker, if uh, she's participating in the film, I considered it as a material participation. Like even of I- Of course, it, it gels so with the film, yeah. film, no doubt. It gels, uh, absolutely, no, no doubt. Yeah, yeah, so please, I also, please, my voiceover is also there. So my mm -hmm. voice and my presence. So uh, it's just a very, very, uh, you know, participation from my side. Yeah. I, I think that's actually when I was watching, it and listening to your voiceover and your participation, it kind of forced me to engage in one way and to take part and to start thinking about the questions and uh, just pick up two things that I would struck me and then uh, I'd like to sort of open it up also to Ryan. Um, I think the way you sort of punctuated it with people's dreams at certain points, I think, oh God, I'm going to forget their mm. names, but the son maybe of Chaitanya Behra or maybe not. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, and he's talking about his dreams of cricket and tabla. And, yeah, yeah. and then his son. Mahindra, uh, and Mahindra, Mahindra, just, Mahindra. Um, yeah, and the shadow puppet, the yeah. dream to educate people. And then the dream of Dr. Gorong Gudash. Everybody's sort of dreams come at certain points and you suddenly yeah. there's that kind of whole lifetime or a young person's sense of the future. And um, again, one of those moving things about being backstage and as you said, sitting next to the puppeteer, seeing Chaitanya Behra singing and sort of his expression changing, being in the movement, those yeah. things get through. But uh, also what is impressive is the way you got so many voices in and so many spaces in it, maybe in a simple story if you like, but it was extremely to bring the sense of many different kinds of histories and progress and up and down. And I think that brings us to the question of I mean, you've opened up those questions. What is transformation art? Is it extending into other castes? You know, what is authentic? Is this new? Yeah, yeah. And do I reskill myself in many ways? I don't leave footprints behind. And there's so many things that everybody says. So when we're talking about performing arts and transformation, it's such a complex question over times and generations. Ryan, would you like to just come in on that for a bit and the kind of thoughts that this film uh, opened up for you or would you like to respond? So before I actually get to that question, I would actually add two cents to what Vijayan had asked about you showing your presence in the film, which when I viewed it, I thought it was intentional and that you wanted to show the backstage of the film as well, while you were focusing on how the puppeteers were working. I thought maybe you wanted to show how the film was also made, which I thought was something on a meta level, bringing into that point. To get back to the question about the cultural differences and everything, uh, what we see right now is that all of these art forms, like no matter what, like, you know, all these culturally dying art forms that have taken on a modern turn and everything, while on a whole, the world is trying to break boundaries of caste, religion and everything, we kind of authenticate or we try to attach this culturally caste or religious background to art forms as well. And that is something that I question a lot where, for mm. example, if you take traditional art forms in India, they are religiously rooted. No matter what yeah. you do, they are religiously rooted. And like she asked this question, is it authentic only if it is done by people in those religions? Is it authentic only if it is done by those people in those castes? Because if we're trying to bring forward those art forms and actually spread it across the world, shouldn't it actually break that boundary of caste, culture, religion and be taken up by other forms, you know, other regions and other castes and other religions? How does that actually affect the authenticity? Like, I would actually like to discuss about that. What do you think? I mean, every generation will have different answers. So in, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, in my opinion, I really believe that this caste uh, boundary or religious boundary shouldn't exist within art because art in itself has no boundaries. Art in itself is open exploration. Art has no bounds, right? So if, for example, a Sufi song is sung by a person who practiced that and comes from that generation, that does not mean the same Sufi song when sung by someone from a different religion. For example, let's say Christianity, someone who follows Christianity and not Sufism is singing a Sufi song. Uh, it still is the same song. It still is coming from that same emotion. The person singing it is still singing it because he wants to sing that and express that. So my, in my opinion, these boundaries shouldn't exist. And yeah, why definitely we... should not exist, yeah. But you know, uh, it takes time the way, uh, if, if you take the case of Maguni Charan Kaur, he also appropriated the art form from a community right. of uh, Jhara community, fisherman community. Uh, you know, community also has a lot to do uh, in creating that art form. You know, how you go about your life, what you do in life, that also affects a bit. 
you know, to nurture the art form, how you are performing it. So, uh, you know, if you are, a, let's say, uh, a corporate uh, employee, how your day is and ho how you are exposed to the nature or the people or everything matters, how you create art. So I am not, you know, taking, um, I mean, I'm not talking about the religion or caste here. I'm just talking how they go about their life and how that must have shaped the art form. So that, that in that perspective, the art form is connected to the community in that perspective. But coming to the caste and religion and everything, yeah, we have been struggling around it. We have been really struggling around it. And as I said, every generation will have a quick fix to it or will have uh, will get invested in it or try to change it in its own way. So it takes time. Maguni Mosa, Maguni Chalankur appropriated the art form, being Kshatriya, let's say. I'm just uh, underlining these things. Uh, being an upper caste, let's say. But he just, you know, uh, even many people asked him not to pursue that form because it was performed by a low caste, considerably low caste community. So, uh, okay, the, these are there, okay, in places. These are there. These might not be there in our minds, but these are there in spaces. This is real. So that we need to understand. So he was asked not to do it, but he just went ahead because uh, the uh, guru with whom he was learning the you know, puppet making and everything, uh, he asked him to you know, pursue this and take it forward. And the, you know, just the amount of love that he had and the engagement, more than love, the engagement, when, once you are engaged with something, you just fall in love with that and you want to pursue that. Is that kind of thing happened with Maguni uh, Charankor and he wanted to take it forward. And it was his just love out, towards the art form and the caste, religion, everything was, uh, you know, he left behind and he took it forward. He changed the, uh, uh, initially the puppets are very small. Uh, they were just very community-based, small performances, but then he took it to a different level. He appropriated the dance uh, art form, but he took it to a different level. And if there was a play of like caste and religion and everything, I don't think I would have met Maguni Mosa at this point, and I would have you know be moved by his uh, you know passion towards his art form, whatever it is, uh, so much. So he left the idea of caste and religion at some point. And also with the privilege of uh, you know uh, an upper caste, of course. Also, because he was uh, from an upper caste and uh, he was a little bit of privilege, he thought that not monetarily, uh, maybe, I'm not talking about financially, but yeah, he was a bit, and then he could take it forward. So that's how that appropriation happens. So, but that took 60 years, uh, like 50 years, think of it. <clears throat> and how, how, and in the film, there is also one example, how Gorangi Charundas has taken this art form, how he has, you know, um, adapted this. And what is his, being a very educated, prolific person, how, what is his idea of even appropriating an art form? He talk, talks about caste, he talks about being outcast, he talks about the authenticity and tradition, everything. Does Maguni Mosa talk about it? No. He only knows the language of art. He only knew that he fell in love with puppetry performance and he wanted to pursue it through his life. So every person has his own notion and the amount of knowledge we have or awareness we have, we try to just uh, see the reflection in our uh, work and everything. So that's why the uh, Goranga Charanda's way of, you know, uh, talking about this, seeing this art form is different. Being an artist is different. And Maguna Charan, uh, who are being an artist and even talking about this art form is very, very different. If you see Robbie Das, the very old puppeteer who uh, could not pursue his uh, own tradition, he talks very differently about his art form as if the entire art form and the practices inside his body, it just comes so naturally as if he's speaking and singing suddenly, you know? So, how you, you know, uh, perform the art form or what is your practice and how far it is from your 
religion and caste the idea of it is it, it's so individualistic but at the same time it is also very influenced by the community that you are living in the space how how uh, progressive your space is your villages or your small town is it also depends on that how much uh, exposure or how much freedom you are getting even maguni uh, charan ko uh, just went ahead and did this uh, bhagya character who is a drunkard and he just talks rubbish he could do that because he had that kind of a freedom and with that fun and everything he could also give a small message to the community with that humor and everything he had that freedom but other people didn't have he didn't care about the society what other people will say or whatever comment but he just went ahead so it is also i think depends on the community that we are living what is your village what is your town what is your space and what is your mind space and how you are um, you know how you have lived your life so uh, yeah. sorry please go please go you were saying yeah, right. no and um, no i was just saying i think you did that so uh, that's also one of the things that you've done so beautifully really given the sense of the individual life's experience that somebody you love like dr gorongo or maguni kuan uh, as well as the concepts with which you're making sense of things everybody is saying that oh well he's well off he can do this it was ours and so on the sort of ways in which you're making yeah. sense of your reality as well as your own life and how it is um what I, again i thought was very interesting one thing you've done was how you give the sense of the ceremonial scene about how he's getting this award saying you've kept this art form alive and then you sort of i think soon after that you're this room where they're arguing and and yeah. sort of doing that and how you you know that kind of intense discussion and um i mean in terms of the construction of the film um did you sort of visualize that you were going to be doing it like this sort of introducing us to all the characters in the beginning and then making us sort of see it again looking at them differently because one thing i remember watching the glove puppetry in the panning of the audience and also sort of watching them and saying is the young child bored or is it only the older women who are keeping time or something and then you see the next time and they're all participating and learning how to handle it and so on so there's that kind of deepening of experience for me uh, did, i mean the construction of that process um that film was that's something and also that why did the last scene did you decide not to have the shadows playing and the projector the rabun chaya on the rock and the uh, ohp why did you say that will not i decided not to use that uh actually uh, in my first pitching uh, films division pitching um uh, we i had a very good film me kajuri and we were discussing for one and a half hour long like first pitching in kolkata films and there were two very eminent filmmakers so um during that time i was when i was pitching it for the first time i was very 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 excited that i have to do something about it if i know these people and and i know the you know as you asked me that why did you uh, keep the name backstage backstage is like uh, the way you mentioned that scene uh, some uh, the glove puppeteer is getting awarded and uh, the next shot was they are discussing about their you know how the problems and issues and they are just talking about with each other so to me that's the backstage uh, and i was a part of it also and that comes very natural because you know i have spent a lot of time with them so it is very easy for them to even um, you know discuss uh, in this way in front of me whether we are shooting or we are just there so that is the backstage that i was exploring and uh, but when i wanted to make the film i just kept it like that but backstage okay because i am uh, telling the story uh, of backstage you know it's not on stage and Uh, behind the scene what is happening and how are the puppeteers their life the politics the social canvas and everything it was just in my mind uh, so i just kept it backstage but as a filmmaker i don't know um, to me why you make films <laughs> maybe to you know experience the film completely and i experienced why i kept the name backstage and i through the uh, you know filmmaking process so it was very justified at the end of the process oh okay i am i am also a part of the backstage and you know i uh, i was a part of their discussion their conflicts and 
uh, I'm not only the audience who is uh, watching the performance. Uh, so um, coming to the structure of the film, yes. Uh, so in the pitching session, uh, after one and a half hours, as a filmmaker asked me that, just give me a visual from your scene, uh, for, from your film. You are very passionate, you know everything about this and you are also uh, researching, you will research more and we, we know. But what do you want to give a cinematic scene, uh, visualization of a film? So I don't know whether I should say it or not, but at that point in time, I didn't have any visual in my mind. I wanted to explore and I wanted to slowly explore and shoot and also yeah. understand how I want to make film. That should be also a part of the process of mm -hmm. filmmaking because as a documentary filmmaker, you should you are not supposed to be very accurate and you know everything and then you go to shoot. Mm -hmm. You should have that process of a bit of exploration. Then after some time, you get to a point where you know that, okay, now I want to shoot this or I want to take it forward like this. So I wasn't sure at all, but just to, you know, get the point, maybe bonus point, mm -hmm. I just constructed a scene. <laughs> <laughs> which will be cinematic, which will be, you know, which will be attractive and which might be approved as a very good scene for a documentary like this, which will be produced by a, uh, film, uh, by a body, uh, which will give you some, this, these many lads to make the film. So maybe for that point, I constructed the scene at that, at that point and I just said it, that didn't have any, any, I didn't create it, I didn't uh, thought about it. It was just for maybe the bonus point. But later when I experienced the film and the process and everything, that entire scene, uh, you know, how I wanted to start a scene or how I wanted to visualize the entire thing got completely changed. And then I thought, okay, I need to keep all these layers in the film and uh, I have to forget about how the cinematic graph of the film will be. You know, these layers need to be there, otherwise the film will be incomplete. And obviously, um, as a filmmaker, you grow also, and maybe after five years, I could have done it in a better way or something, because it also involves a lot of craft, editing, scripting, and everything. Uh, I could have done it better, but I thought that, uh, you know, I edited the film, so it was a huge task for me, so many footage. But I thought that the main, Cinematic graph would be uh, the presence of the character, their characterization, the socio-political, you know, uh, layers, and a bit of, you know, you can't put everything in this uh, this long film. So, and also a little longer performances, you know, uh, in the film where one minute, two minute, three minute performance at least you can put so that uh, the continuation will be there. It's not that in a promo of a performance, uh, the hand puppeteer who is performing is almost performing for three minutes and uh, you are watching him just like as you would watch it, uh, just standing in a village and just looking at him. So I wanted to put some performance like that also. So it is a whatever I wanted to put, I want to put, and then I'll decide the structure of the film. So everything was put and then I thought I didn't bother about the cinematic uh, expression or the graph of the film for this particular film. So the priority was uh, whatever experience I had, at least everything should be uh, in the film because I don't know when I'll get uh, the next uh, you know chance to even do a further research or make a film like this. Uh, adding on to that question, okay. I would actually like mm -hmm. to talk about this. Uh, having spent nine years researching and you know being a part of that art form and like learning from them. How much did their, because this is also a visual form of storytelling that they practice, all four forms. How much has that style affected your filmmaking? Did you at any point decide that I want to, you know, adapt what they do and show that in the film? Like I want my style of film to be that way. Did it ever affect your storytelling? Well, oh, that's a good question. Actually, I answered it somewhere else also. Um, actually, it was not nine, nine years. The intensive research was for like, let's say two years. Then we didn't very, you know, 
we didn't meet them uh, often during when I was pitching for the film. There was a obviously gap for a year or so till I get the funding. Then the funds came. Then, you know, whenever they came to the city or I went to their places, we met occasionally. So it was like that. It wasn't that, uh, it wasn't the scene that I really researched for and I really, no, it wasn't. So there was this two years of intensive research under that folklore research support. And then uh, during the pitching of the film, I really re uh, revisited everything, saw the footage and uh, try to understand what I want to do. But believe me, till now, if you ask me uh, what you wanted to do, why did you make it? I seriously don't have answer. I'm just making it up. I'm just trying to come up with answers. Seriously, I don't have any answer for that. And coming to your point, then of course, two years of intensive research, then the pitching, then during the filmmaking process, which are two years, then the engagement, and they are in touch anyway. So it wasn't like nine years of research. Then the pandemic came, the film got <laughs> delayed, then it didn't get approval because it was two hours long. I had to uh, make it 85 minutes long. So the story was also made la more layered when it was two, two hours uh, long. I had to cut it. So uh, that, was, that, was the, that was also a process. Now you said that their art form and influence of their form on my uh, filmmaking thing. So um, the thing is, they have a form uh, in which they uh, perform their art form. And uh, my documentary filmmaking, I mean, nonfiction, it also has uh, a form to it, a style to it, let's say. So, uh, Know where I, uh, uh, I mean, I decided that my form should not overpower everything. It should be in sync. And, uh, uh, you know, my form is completely different and coming from a very different uh, perspective. And they are in a very different pitch. And so, because there was a familiarity and uh, it is also, it also important where you are putting your camera, in the same manner it is important where you are putting yourself as a filmmaker, what is the distance and where, from where you are looking at them. So that defined the, you know, even, even the magnification, the how far the camera is, uh, you know, it, it's not too very close or not, at times it is very close because we are just sitting next to them and, you know, not physically, I'm saying uh, philosophically, how distant you are from the art form or the artist. And that also, um, that also affect the distance physically, the distance of the camera from the character. So that everything, everything uh, affected me. The most important thing was that the, the familiarity between me uh, and other people we speak the same language and language is also very important in this film. Uh, the, two days back, we had a very intimate screening of this film and there's a non odia speaking person and there's odia speaking people and the non odia speaking person was very connected to this film and he has uh, seen it uh, multiple times. But when he attended the uh, screening with so many odia speaking people and the points where people would respond and laugh and just get that point he having seen the film so many times he never got it you know he was thinking that might be the weakest point but that was the strongest point point in the film for odia speaking people and they just got it so it, the language also mattered and because i can speak odia very well and i understand i think in odia odia is my language my primary language of expression so that was a very, uh, I mean, there was a sink. And when there is a sink, it uh, tunes everything, I think. You know, where do you want to put the camera? How do you want to make him comfortable or uncomfortable or put the sound? Everything, everything. I think that helped. Yeah. Um, 
you know, when you talked about being in tune, the audience has often seemed extremely attuned. I mean, I'm speaking very much as a complete outsider and a completely metropolitan person. Just a question, did your sense of the dying art form, what it's a dying art form and what you went there, did that change at all over the process or stay there, but change, sort of add theirs to it, if you like, that these are dying arts and, and should we just open up to what, how do art forms, when do they, what changes in art, what puts it at risk, what makes it vulnerable in other kinds of conditions, which I think you were also speaking about, but maybe you could start. Did, do you, uh, yeah, so I was saying, do you still see these as, uh, I know you talked about one person whom you'd met who passed away the next time you yeah, yeah, went. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, did your sort of sense of, uh, the imminence of the death of the form, is that still I the mean, same? Yeah. I mean, uh, look at uh, shadow puppetry, where uh, you don't get to see the old, the old style of shadow puppetry anymore, but it's living in a way. Okay, the uh, groups are getting funded and getting a little bit of support, and many people in India, um, in many corners, they know about the uh, shadow puppetry uh, group in Orissa, not the Gauranga Charandasas group, the other group in Orissa, and. Uh, they got a bit of support and, but the uh, style of puppetry and everything, a bit of form got changed, you know, in the process. So whether you call it death or not, a bit of death or decay, uh, it's up to your individual take. So yeah, that the art form got degenerated a bit during the process of survival, right? So... I, yeah, I think we have got um, five more minutes because uh, I mean, uh, we'll ex we have extended it by five to eight minutes more. So if Thank I can you. just make a, a couple of observations. Uh, one was that um, um, like uh, <clears throat> um, the particular um, uh, Raman Chaya, it gives uh, uh, the anti-hero sort of uh, prominence, uh, Raman getting this thing. Um, is it across uh, only in that particular thing or uh, all other uh, forms, basically? Uh, in puppetry? Yes. In Odisha? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, you notice, uh, because normally Ram is the hero. Here it is Raman Chaya. So Raman is being given prominence. The prominence. Okay, there is no certain Ram answer to it. Even yeah. the puppeteers, uh, they don't know they that. Don't know. Mm -hmm. They uh, they know that the name, uh, it has been called Ravan Chaya and there are so many theories and myths around it. There are two, three uh, stories around it, what happens or not. So they follow that. Uh, and, uh, okay, the, the actually, uh, Ravan is a dark personality and the Chaya is dark and they associated everything around that and Ravan Chaya. There is one, this theory. Whatever. And very visually yeah. also 10 heads means in that. Yeah, there's a darker have, uh, Chaya uh, and that, Ravan. That also may be. So I, 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 I got an opportunity to connect it to the painting which is getting faded. And that is called Ravan Chaya in that cave painting, in that cave, the last scene of the film, if you remember. Uh, and I track, uh, I just show the painting very clearly and I say that this painting is called Ravan Chaya. But we don't know whether it is called Ravan Chaya or it is a legend or what is happening in this painting. And after many years, every art form or any practice might face that situation, you know. Many legends would be there or people will not be there and some people will tell some story and that will be accepted. And the the presence of the painting in my film, I think, shows the see, uh, you know, state of the art form uh, that I have, you know, considered in my film. So that also express a bit of uh, the state of art form at this point, where right? when it is faded and the name is not written properly and. Uh, yeah, we can't see it properly, whether it is authentic, whether it is not. So yeah, that somehow summar summarizes my film. I think there's uh, so much that you've left us to think with, and I think we can continue this discussion in many ways, in many uh, directions uh, we mm -hmm. can go. Um, I think Diane had earlier talked about, uh, was just before you came, he was talking about dilution, you talked about degeneration, and these are things that we'll, um, 
keep grappling with just as the people you are speak, have been interacting with are working with it, living with it and giving us ways to think about. But um, thank you very much. I mean, I think you've encapsulated so much in that 80 minutes which you've offered us. And um, I think we'll be keep returning to it as we sort of yeah. look for answers and discover this place. So. Mm, yes, I think it's almost a tie up. And uh, I mean, uh, the movie, the most uh, touching image is that of uh, Rabi Daz. Uh, uh, he's just uh, re reclining in the court and uh, um, that uh, amount, I mean, that particular image will keep haunting at least me for quite a long period. And uh, uh, on behalf of Nifi, I would like to thank you for being with us and uh, we wish um, that uh, many, many laurels will come on your way in your future uh, uh, film career and uh, we hope to uh, have you. your um, uh, interactions and uh, uh, association with us in the future events also and uh, so thank you so much Lipika and uh, yeah thank you so much and uh, I also wish many addition to Nifi and many such films and uh, there's some amazing films which uh, Nifi is showing and everything is coming together very well Yes. And to Niharika, thank you uh, so much. And uh, uh, see, as you know, Film Division mm -hmm. and uh, even uh, Sahabedia is our outreach partner. And so um, thanks to Sahabedia, Film Division, mm -hmm. and to you personally, uh, Niharika, for sparing Great your pleasure. time and uh, being with us. Uh, we really enjoyed uh, your presence. And yeah, uh, Ryan, thank, thank you, you for the discussion. <laughs> yeah, please. And Ryan, thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, maybe uh, like I uh, will uh, definitely look forward to having your presence in so many of our activities in future also uh, because uh, we make it a point that uh, some youngsters should be a part of, of, of our uh, this thing so that they also get to get the exposure and all that so thanks everyone uh, so good night for the time being uh, yeah thank you so bye bye good, good night. night thank you thank you yeah